Hello YouTube, this is CN Maritime History here back again with another video. Tonight I will be talking about the USS Thresher. The contract to build the USS Thresher was awarded to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on January 15, 1958, and her keel was laid on May 28, 1958. She was launched bow first on, the, on July 9, 1960, and was sponsored by Mary B. Warder, wife of World War II skipper Frederick B. Warder, and was commissioned on August 3, 1961. Thresher conducted lengthy sea trials in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean Sea areas in 1961 to 1962. These tests led a thorough evaluation of her many new and complex technological features and weapons. She took part in Nuclear Submarine Exercise 361 off the northern coast of the United States on the 18th to 24th of September 1961. On the 18th of October 1961, Thresher, in company with the diesel-electric submarine Kavala, headed south on a three-week test and training cruise to San Juan, Puerto Rico, or in a, to San Juan, Puerto Rico, arriving November the 2nd. Following customary procedure while in port, her reactor was shut down. Since no shore power connection was available in San Juan, the ship's backup diesel generator was used to carry the hotel electrical loads. Several hours later, the backup generator broke down and the electrical load was transferred to the, ship's, to the ship's battery. As most of the battery power was needed to keep vital systems operating and restart the reactor, lighting and air conditioning were shut down. Without air conditioning, temperature and humidity in the submarine rose, reaching 140 degrees Fahrenheit after about 10 hours. The crew attempted to repair the diesel generator, four men would receive Navy commendation medals for their work that night. After it became apparent that the generator could not be fixed before the battery was depleted, the crew tried to restart the reactor, but the remaining battery charge was insufficient. The captain returning to the ship from a shore function arrived just after the battery ran down. The crew eventually borrowed cables from another, from another ship in the harbor. Now, I wouldn't have thought that a submarine could have jumper cables, but I guess it could. Which started her diesel, no, not diesels, started her diesels and provided enough power to allow Thresher to restart her reactor. Thresher conducted further trials and fired test torpedoes before returning to Portsmouth on November the 29th, 1961. The boat remained in port through the end of that year and spent the first two months of 1962 with her sonar and sub rock systems. That was her revolutionary anti uh, missile, no, not, not anti missile, I think it was anti ship missile system. State of the art at that time. In March, she, she participated in uh, 262. Uh, the, I'm probably going to butcher this N sub X exercise 262, an exercise designed to improve the tactical cap capabilities of nuclear submarines and in an anti submarine warfare training with Task Group Alpha. Off Charleston, South Carolina, Thresher undertook operations supporting development of the sub rock anti submarine missile, so it's not an anti ship. She returned briefly to New England waters, after which she proceeded to Florida for more sub-rock tests. While moored at Port Canaveral, Florida, the submarine was accidentally struck by a tug, which damaged one of her ballast tanks. And in case you don't know, a ballast tank is what, a, is what allows a uh, submarine to uh, sink and float. After repairs at Groton, Connecticut, by the Electric Boat Company, Thresher went south for more tests and trials off Key West, Florida, then returned northward. The submarine entered Portsmouth Shipyard on July 16, 1962 to begin a scheduled six-month post-shakedown availability to examine systems and make repairs and corrections as necessary. As is typical with a first-of-class boat, the work took longer than expected, lasting nearly nine months. The ship was finally recertified and undocked on April 8, 1963. On April 9, 1963, Thresher, commanded by Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, left from Kittery, Maine at 8 a.m. and met with the submarine rescue ship Skylark at 11 a.m. to begin her initial post-overhaul dive trials. Now, as you can see from this chart, this is what happened to her, as I will explain in a moment. In an area some 220 miles, 350 kilometers, east of, actually 190 nautical miles, east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. That afternoon, Thresher conducted an initial trim dive test, surfaced, and then performed a second dive to half of test step. She remained submerged overnight, but re-established underwater communications of Skylark, that was her surface ship, at 6.30 a.m. on April 10th to commence deep dive trials. Following standard practice, Thresher slowly dove deeper as she traveled in circles under Skylark, remained within communications distance, pausing every 30 meters, 100 feet of depth, to check the integrity of all systems, especially near her test step, 
Skylark received garbled communications of her underwater telephone indicating minor difficulties have positive up angle attempting to blow. And then a final, even more garbled message that included number 900. Now, what I mean by that is they are trying to blow the ballast tanks to get the ship to rise up. That does not mean make them explode, that means shove all the water up. Because to make them sink, you need to have the ballast tanks flooded with water. When Skylark received no further communication, service observers gradually re realized Thresher had sunk. So, in the first one here, you can see USS Skylark. Thresher starts its descent of a target of reaching 1,000 feet, levels off at 400, and checks for leaks. The second one, about 30 minutes later, uh, Harvey reports reaching 1,000 feet without incident. That's the commander in charge of the Thresher. About 45 minutes after, a pipe apparently ruptured, flooding the engine room. The water lane causes electrical failures that shut down the reactor. Commander Harvey orders an emergency blow in the main ballast. We don't really know what happened. The only thing we know is that we are experiencing minor, minor difficulties, what they said, and involved in the number 500. We can guess what happened, pretty much. But everyone who was on the submarine died. No question about it. You cannot swim from that depth. The pressure will kill you either way. And then, the su number four, sub grows heavier from the flooding and the engine room, it sinks. Skylark, Skylark here is another attempt to blow the ballast tanks and a minute later detects the sounds of an implosion. This would be the Thresher pretty much collapsing in on itself and they say it likely imploded between 1,300 and 2,000 feet beneath the surface. Thresher's remains scatter across a wide field about 8,400 feet below the surface. The site has shown no elevated levels of radiation from her reactor. And Thresher has a very, very significance about her. She's the very first United States nuclear submarine. Yeah. And she sank in the bottom of the ocean. By mid-afternoon, 15 Navy ships were en route to the search area. At 6.30, the commander of Submarine Force Atlantic sent word to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard to begin notifying the crew's sailing members, starting with Commander Harvey Swipe Irene that Thresher was missing. Crew of Naval Operations Admiral George W. Anderson Jr. went before the press corps at the Pentagon to announce that the submarine was lost of all hands. President John F. Kennedy ordered all flights to be flown at half staff from 12 to 15 of April in order of, in honor of the 129 lost submariners and shipyard personnel. Now, you may recognize the name here. Someone very special in a certain White Starliner's story. The Navy quickly mounted an extensive search of surface ships and support from the Naval Research Laboratory with its deep, with its deep search capability. The laboratory's small research vessel Rockville with a unique trainable search sonar left on April 12, 1962 for the search area. Rockville was to be followed by other personnel with a deep camera system. Allegheny, Mission Capistrano, and Prevail became engaged in a close sonar search of an area 10 nautical miles, 12 regular miles, square. Atlantis II, Robert D. Conrad, and James L. Gillis, these are all ships, investigated likely contacts found in the sonar search. The, the NRL detailed camera system and personnel later operated from James, L., James M. Gillis with some success, widening the breeze later confirmed to be from Thresher. The Vatosphere of Trieste was alerted on April 11th and brought from San Diego to Boston. It was deployed for two series of dives into the debris field, the first taking place from the 24th to the 30th of June, and the second taking place from late August until early September. The equipment handling capability of Gillis provided ina inadequate, even hazardous, to handle the towed vehicle, and the entire search was paused in September. By morning on April, on April 11th, submarines USS Seawolf and USS Sea Owl, both operating near Thresher's location, were ordered to join in the search uh, for the missing submarine as well. The inadequacy of the existing small auxiliary general ocean Oceanographic, I think I said that right, research, or AGOR, A G O R, vessels such as the James M. Gillis for handling deep towed search vehicles led for, to a search for a vessel of a size and configuration that can handle such equipment in a sheltered area. In late 1963, that search resulted in the acquisition of Mizar with the intent to eventually add a sheltered center well for deploying equipment. 1964 search included Mizar with partial modifications but not a center well, Hoist, and Trieste 2, 
Triestes, the bathysphere's successor. That submersible Trieste II incorporated parts of the original bathys bathyscape. It was completed in early 1964. The bathys the bathyscape was placed on board USNS Private Francis X. McGraw and shipped to Boston. Mizar did not have a system called underwater tracking equipment by which it could track. Oh, it's, it did. By which it could track its tow vehicle, and it was planned for use to track Trieste. The Mizar sailed on the 25th of June to begin the deep search and found the wreck within two days. The shattered remains of Thresher's Hall were on the seafloor, about 2,600 meters, 8,400 feet below the surface, in five major sections. Most of the breeze had spread over an area of 134,000 square meters, 33 acres. Major sections of Thresher, including the sail, sonar dome, bow section, engineering spaces section, operations spaces section, and the stern planes were found. By July 22nd, most of the lost submarine had been photographed. In early August, the entire task force returned to the area with the submersible. Its first two dives were unsuccessful, but on the third dive, the UTE enabled placement of the Trieste II on the wreck, at first not seeing wreckage because the bath escape was sitting upon it. That while operating as a unit of the search force, the USS Seawolf recorded possible electronic emissions and underwater noises. None of the signals which Seawolf received equated with anything could have been originated by human beings in the case of radiation. This is Thresher's, uh, like, symbol. The cause of the sinking. Deep sea photography recovered artifacts and evaluation of Thresher's design and operational history permitted a court of inquiry that concluded that the submarine had probably suffered the failure of a saltwater piping system joint that relied heavily on silver brazing instead of welding. Earlier tests using ultrasound equipment found potential problems with just about 14% of the tested braze joints, most of which were determined not to pose a risk enough, significant enough to require repair. But on November the 30th, 1960, nearly three years prior to the accident, the barbell suffered to the silver braze joy failure in a near test step while on an exercise flooding the engine roof and estimated 18 tons of water in the three minutes it took to service under power and with blown tanks. This incident was followed months later by more silver brace failures in the Abraham Lincoln during trials. High pressure water sprayed from a broken pipe may have shorted out one of the many electrical panels, causing a shutdown or stram of the reactor, which in turn caused loss of propulsion. Inability to blow the ballast tanks was later attributed to excessive moisture in the submarine's high pressure air flasks, moisture that froze and plugged the flask's flow paths while passing through the valves. This was later simulated in dockside castle, Thresher's sister ship, sister ship, not sister ship, sister sub to Nosa. During a test to simulate blowing ballast out or near test step, ice formed on stranders and solar valves. The flow of air lasted only a few seconds. Um, let's see, here we go. The monitoring data confirm that there has been no significant effect on the environment on the seafloor because of Thresher's, you know, radiation from her reactor. Nuclear fuel in the submarine remains intact. In, this is the part I was going to tell you guys about. Information declassified in the 2008 National Geographic documentary Titanic Bowers' Secret Mission shows that USNR Commander Dr. Robert Bowers, the, the ocean oceanographer, I can never pronounce that right, credited with locating the wreck of the RMS Titanic was sent by the Navy on a mission under cover of the search for Titanic to map and collect visual data on the Thresher and Scorpion wrecks. I, I will talk about the Scorpion in another video. Ballard had approached the Navy in 1982 for funding the fine Titanic of his new deep-diving deep, deep ro robot submersible. The Navy granted him the funds of the submarine wrecks were surveyed before Titanic. He only had 12 days after he had surveyed them uh, because of financial limitations. But, uh, that's the story of the Thresher, and sadly, almost all records of the Court of Inquiry remain unavailable to the public, but, last year, on May 22, 2020, the Navy stated in a court-mandated status report that due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the Navy's Undersea Warfare Division had placed the records review on hold as N-97 staff were limited to supporting mission essential tasks supporting undersea forces and operations only. They will return to the review and process of plaintiff's FOIA request once the office is able to expand beyond mission essential capabilities. Following the re release of the July 18, 2020 court mandated report, the Navy stated that they identified and approved additional resources and reservists to begin processing documents in August. The Navy begins a rolling release of the records on September 23, 2020. 
The aftermath of the public relations aspect of this major disaster has since been part of various case studies. So this is the story of the Thresher, and like I said, it does stretch to modern day, as we are still learning new information about her from the court inquiry documents in the 1960s and 80s, depending on, you know, when it, the inquiry was, and Dr. Ballard's uh, insight into it. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this USS Thresher video. Um, I have made four videos today, so I'm kind of tired. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope I didn't sound too tired. Um, and uh, have a good night.